Tell us, what's it called? Well, it's, Where do we get it? It's, it's all good record stores. Places, all the things. Google, I presume, it's there as well. Spotify? Yes, yes, it's, it's in all the, all the places. Go out and buy it. Yes, go out and buy it. Uh, is the thing you know it's uh, it's been a long kind of couple of years but uh you yeah, know we're, we're uh, very happy to have it out and it, the reaction's been great you know brilliant it's, i think it's the kind of thing that uh yeah it's it's the realization of something it isn't something that has been ongoing so it feels like uh yeah a long process so i don't know i think uh we'll be out and playing gigs soon and that's the most important thing that's when you get word that You've gone to number one, like, is there a big family celebration? Do you all get together and go crazy, or do you have to be real cool, hipster, arty, <laughs> and put the head down and go, it's not about that? Yeah, well, it isn't about that. Uh, no, it's, <laughs> like, it's, it's about the art at the end of the day. No, it's, it's great, you know. There's another line in the press release, I suppose, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, congratulations on that. Uh, you can get in touch, 53106. We're live on Facebook, on YouTube, on Periscope as well, so do leave a comment. And we're here with AIR, the home of AIR Sport. Get amazing live sporting content free with AIR Broadband. So, a few things we want to get into. Uh, one of them maybe is about, uh, about hype and selling things and putting yourself out there and... We were talking about Katie Taylor outside and whether they're getting the right amount of hype and whether we're eventually going to see her back here for a world title fight at the uh, Three Arena. At the moment, it doesn't look like it. From your point of view, just going back to selling the album, yeah. do you just accept that it's part of the gig? You've got to go out there, you've got to go on every radio show, every TV show, you never say no? I think that one of the hardest things about being a musician is that you have to kind of have these... You know, you know, a lot of, lot of things in your skill set, I suppose. Mm. It's one thing, you know, being good at playing the guitar and writing songs or, or spending all your time in the studio, but it's a very different thing being out and trying to sell it to people. And, you know, I think you have to do it, you know, and it's the same with, with Katie and, and with anyone else. And sometimes the better you are at selling something, the better you'll, you'll be. And I don't, I personally, I wish it was just, you know, you could, you could just play, but it is nowadays you know you've got to be a personality you have to be big on instagram you've got to be big on facebook you've got to be box office for for stories mm. you know like and especially for uh, uh, someone like katie taylor you're talking about i mean she boxed uh, at the start of the week and i hadn't heard about it, that it was on i mean which is mad because i would always be interested but i didn't know it was on i found out the next day that you know that she'd won she'd unified the belts and everything but i mean well i don't i don't know how it has happened that she can be uh you know, something like something as big as that isn't as well publicised. And I, w I was wondering whether it's her style because she's not showy. She's not. Uh, she's not saying how she's going to smash. You know, the other girl or anything like that. You know, it isn't like that at all with her. It's very much. You know, she's respectful and stuff. And I wonder, what, in that kind of style, does she need to? Uh, not that I want her to, but does does that need to happen for her? You know. Yeah, the Katie professional era is very interesting to look at, Sinead, from a selling yeah. hype point of view because yeah. so Brian Peters came out this week and he explained he doesn't think we're going to see Katie back in Ireland anytime soon because of several circumstances one of which is that it's very hard to put a professional fight on in Ireland right now because of the situation with MTK and because of the fallout still from the shootings at the Regency Hotel that there's still a huge amount of issues about that that you simply may not be able to get a license Part of me also wonders if they feel that they're in a position whereby if Katie was to come back, they could actually sell enough tickets to fill out the three arena. Yeah, I think a lot of the time if you're talking about sports that are maybe niche or not mainstream, mm. so if you're not talking about soccer or, or rugby, and especially if you're talking about women's sports, you do have to make that connection for people. So a lot of people will, will support her, want her to do well, want uh, women's teams to do well, but they mightn't make that extra effort to actually go to the match or buy a box office. I think with Katie it's different. Irish people feel a huge connection to Katie. It, it, at the Olympics in London, obviously there was a huge amount of hype because it was so close and it, it was almost like a home Olympics. A huge amount of people went over. Mm. Um, I was over there for, I actually didn't get a ticket to her fight, my sister did, so and I went to the guys' fights. Um, well, I remember, I was at, at all her fights at the Olympics, and I remember Natasha Jonas was her first yeah. fight, and I will never remember, it was proper hairs on the back of your neck, yeah when she emerged, I think it was Rihanna playing, and everyone thought, because we'd heard so much about Katie, yeah. we'd rarely seen her in this sort of scenario, and there was such a level of expectation, and it was one of those moments, if you could somehow wrap it all up and sell it, you'd make a fortune, and that was there for those weeks after the yeah. Olympics. 
and part of me feels I think we've I think that connection can be maintained mm. with her so I think there could be you know boxing people are brilliant at creating hype around <laughs> around a, a, a fight so I think it, it would happen I think it would sell out um, and I think you're saying about the personality and, and that's usual that's usually the case but I think with Katie if she just keeps winning that can be her personality just the winning 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 and, no, uh, and keeping that kind of can I remain unbeaten is that a thing that is possible we don't know because we don't follow as a nation boxing close enough specifically mm. women's boxing like so I don't know um, I think, that's I think that would keep the, the interest there but that's part of the problem there's no like you know she's just winning every fight you know and I, I don't know if people are kind of going ah Katie's fighting another you know another person getting you know there's no like you know where's the fights where she's like she's won she's had nine fights she's won them all right I think she might only have, uh, maybe you can correct me, Andy, but she's, there's only three that have even gone to decision. Like, I think she's, like, done so many knockouts. Like, basically, she's, this, where's the, like, huge fight against someone who you never know, you don't know what's going to happen. I think there is definitely a thing where people are just expecting her to sort of yeah, steamroll have, everybody. Uh, um, the problem for her is there's a lack of depth mm. at female professional boxing. The, the fight that she fought last week was a champion for three years, and Katie outclassed her, really, you know. When Katie wanted to, when she wanted to box, she just chose to mix it at times, and there were, you know, it was kind of even in the mixes, but for the most part, Katie outclassed her. Just going back to like Katie selling out tickets, I think it's very hard. People support boxing, but and our fans, but I don't know if they really. There's not a culture of going to fights in Ireland. I know the Olympics, she saw that like the places were packed in the arena, but I think that was her coupled with the Olympics, you know, paired with the Olympics. It was about. You know, there was the expectation from, from Beijing, the team had done so well. Then it was thrown into the Olympics and Katie was such a favourite. And then also being the Olympics in London, there was that kind of, you know... But it, it does take effort. So say hysteria, I think. Like you know, I Leinster don't know. didn't sell out the semi-final. So you would expect in a rugby mad, at this moment in time, this, the country is a bit, you know, there's a huge volume of people who are... Leinster supporters or who are Irish supporters just after a Grand Slam you're going into a semi-final you would expect to, that Aviva to be sold mm. out it wasn't because the European organisers were taking <laughs> the pocket from it so there was no advantage to Leinster really going and selling those tickets advertising and they sell them differently there was no family tickets available yeah. or it was so, a different pricing there, there structure was no, that. there was no advertising around so there was no idea that you could go to that match that I, everyone just presumed it was sold out because it's the Aviva it's a Leinster semi-final in the Champions Cup, I only saw one advertisement for it. It was a poster outside the Shelburne. So you literally had to walk <laughs> by the Shelburne. Well, target to know, your audience. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that you could get a ticket for that match. And we d and they didn't sell it out, which sounds unbelievable. Like Grand Slam winning rugby players a few weeks after that in a Leinster semi-final that they were expected to win, you can't sell it out. So it goes down to being able to, you have to sell it. You have to advertise mm. it. And I think if they advertise Katie, in a way that boxing is so capable of doing. But the fact that they're not... Um, even willing even to do in it, yeah. You know, in, in the, in the build-up to her last fight, that there wasn't much press mm. in Ireland done, you know, that, like you said, there was little awareness that it was going, even taking place. That doesn't... In my mind, that, they, they don't feel that they're going to come to Ireland anytime soon because they would start planting seeds now and promoting her here in all the fights, building her up and doing a lot more interviews should be pushed for that. So I don't think... Like, I don't think they see her coming back here anytime soon. Well, when we go abroad, like, you know, we've been lucky enough to be touring all over the place, and you go to Mexico, you go to, Me you go, go, to go to Moscow, and the things that people know, they know Seamus and they know Conor McGregor. They're the people, Seamus, mm. WWE, and, and Conor McGregor. So it's like, I feel like it's really set up for, for Katie to nail it. Like, she's mm. brilliant, you know. She's like, you know, that, the, the, I saw um, the, what they showed on HBO, of the fight and the power, you know, and there was one thing where it was like a, someone made a gif out of it where she, in the eighth round, she'd pull back and the arms had got, you know, the swings of the arms had gone over, it was like the Matrix or something, you know. Yeah. It was amazing, you know, it's all set up for her, but the only thing that she doesn't have, and this isn't a criticism of her, I don't think it's fair to, to say this to her, but that thing of, you know, just the, the charismatic selling of it, and because there isn't a lot of jeopardy, you know, it's, I, I don't know if people assume that, you know, she's just going to win all the fights, I don't know if people... She's a, she's, a, she's a nice person. I'd say she's a, a, a sensitive, a, 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 you know, a nice person. I don't think she's someone that's going to be out slamming people. But mm. So where does that come from? You know, do the promoters come out and have to build it up? Because someone has to do they that are, for though, her. Because they there are, needs to be they, like this they, thing they, behind her. Like Eddie Hearn is pushing her as the real deal. Like, mm. the re the, you know, no gimmicks. She's a real boxer, regardless of gender. 
So that's the kind of that's the angle they're taking with it. She's and that's never what yeah, Joshua and, does, right? Like, yeah, and she's never gonna. You can't. You can't really. She. She. You couldn't. It would be totally out of character for her to go out now and start talking smack with somebody. You know, it's not gonna. Never gonna happen. Yeah. But th someone might start talking. Like when she fought Jessica Catskills in New York, in your call, the fight previous to this one Just before Christmas. Yeah, she talked like Catskills talked a lot of uh, yeah, a lot of smack, and then and, and it kind of riled Katie up, and it ended up being a better fight than you know than than most people anticipated. So maybe. It's for the opponents to sell the fight, you know, and like for Katie to remain this ambassador for boxing and for and for women in sport, I think, because that's that's where I build see build up that. an invincibility yeah. when people actually know about it. You're 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 perfectly positioned to talk about this, the mm. hype game, and trying to sell yeah. tickets from Thoman Park, Billy Joe Saunders. Mm. That would have been technically, as a boxing fight, an incredible event. Mm. Say far better than Bellew Hay, which is going to sell out the O2 Arena in London tonight, and there'll be 20,000 people, and we're talking about it for weeks, and we're getting them all on the show. Yet, ultimately, that fight didn't go ahead. Yeah. When you look back now, what are we, probably three years on? Like, Do you, do you have we couldn't, a bit we we had more two, thoughts on what you could have done we differently? Like, yeah, well, we couldn't. Like him and I, I was expecting him to come in and, and start running his mouth, because that's what he had done previously. You know, he was a cheeky, cheeky enough chap. But he, he came in with the utmost respect for me and totally, <laughs> totally disarmed me, you know, and I was like, you are having a loving, you know, at the press conference. And I was thinking, this is not the way I, I figured this was going to go. But, um, uh, yeah, it does, it does. And I probably affected my career throughout, you know, by not having, but not... The rematch, this is the rematch of the, this, the Billy Joe Sanders fight. No, the first fight that uh, we had, mm. the only fight we had. But, like... Um, like throughout my career, I would never want to, to, to talk badly about people or to hype myself up, and it probably did affect my career because, like you, you can see it, it, it is an it is a relation to people who talk and, and promote themselves in that way, and the fights and opportunities they they get, you know. And it seems like years ago they didn't need to do that. Everyone they, like fighters conducted themselves in a gentlemanly manner, and the the fights saw that because there was a culture of going to fights. It was you know. Mm. It, it was more ingrained in the culture of general life years ago, boxing, I think. But nowadays, the, the average fan needs a soap opera. You know, he needs... Well, that's they need, do you think that would have worked if, you say, Billy Joe Saunders comes in and he does start giving it all yeah. that, and you f came back and you said, he's coming to my hometown, yeah. I'm going to kill him in yeah, my I'm, old yeah, town, yeah. he's insulting the people of Limerick. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Do you think that would have worked? Do you think, so, think yeah. you would have sold, it, it would have worked and so, it would have yeah, sold out? Would've, yeah, definitely. Should have done that. I know. <laughs> we could have just manufactured well, well, it. We, we know yeah. that's true because, like, look at how MMA has become mm. popular. That, mm. That's because it was put in front of us and, and people were selling to us and it had those personalities. Why is, re why is wrestling, like, uh, what, WWE yeah. now, why is that popular? Because it's a soap opera, yeah. you know, it's, and, and, the and people they're the segments. Well, that's, yeah, like it's, it's, that's soccer people as well, what, though. People know, people buy into the illusion, they know it's fake, but they're into it because of the storylines. Mm. But it's the personalities, and that's the thing that, that's the thing that gets the the great, you know, the, the, the in music they call them the squares. You know, when, when you when you cross over to the squares, that's when you start, you know, becoming big. Because there's always going to be music fans that appreciate what you're yeah. doing, and they'll go, oh, I love the chord change you use in the third chorus. <laughs> but, you know, the lad in the pub who's sitting there, with, you know, he's just going to be like, ah, oh, that's a tune. Did you hear your man doesn't like that fella? You know, and it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's always about the stories, in sport as in music. Yeah. And, and that's the thing, I just think, uh, Katie, I don't know, I, 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 like she has everything, obviously, but it's just, I won't, I, no, listen, I, I hope it isn't the case, because she can just be brilliant, like, like Anthony yeah. Joshua, but it's just, does she, is it going to affect, because I, I don't know, do people look at that, like if you're a boxer and you're like, well, she's not getting the numbers, you know? No, oh, but I know they didn't, like, they didn't show her fight on HBO, but they all watched it, and, and all of them had praise for all the commentators who were there, Roy Jones, Max Kellerman, and Jim Lampley. So they all, so she's definitely on the radar, and that's her second fight in the US, and it's only her ninth or tenth fight, I think. She's only still very early in her career, you know? She's yet to fight any of the other champions beside Barbarossa, so I we'll see. You know, yeah. I, think it's in, I think that they are building it nicely, and I think... It will come, you know, but I'm not sure if she will fight in Ireland again because, like I said, coupled with the Olympics, when they came, when she returned for the Olympics, they had two fights in the Borgash Arena, and I think they struggled to sell tickets there. Yeah, you know, and that was immediately after the Olympics. So well, is that because they need to have a strong undercard? Do you know what I mean? Is that because they need an undercard, mm. and then because they don't can't put MTK fighters or what they yeah. can't fight, so they can't have an undercard? 
unless they bring people in or something. So does that just does it mean that it's very difficult to have any kind of big? Fight? It's just you need an event. So I again, from we've spoken about this, like we spoke the week after the All Ireland Ladies Final last year, of how if you go and properly promote something and make an event, and the one thing a lot of people say of Irish sports fans is that. It's not so much that we're sports fans, it's that we're event junkies. Mm. And if something is big and everyone wants to be there, suddenly we're all on top of that. And that somehow it is a marketing thing that they need to go and create this buzz around Katie for the next yeah. year, I think 18 the months. Buzz around Katie, like I was saying, is the easy bit. And probably what you were saying about it's the opponent that might be the more difficult bit to get that like event, like it's this person versus this person, or it's Katie being invincible about against somebody who actually does have the, the They need to the, stop the building the opponents and, and giving yeah. them a profile and making them more aware. You know, mm. Katie is on everybody's everybody knows her, her name yeah. everyone knows her face she's instantly recognizable so it's about building the opponents and that's holly home holly home well i thought holly home would be a really good opponent for because obviously the, mm. their name and recognition and she'll come from i haven't spent time in mma she'll have that Do you personality think would to, be to talk convincing to fight holly home to go down that route where it is seen more as show busy rather than mm. maybe just been the best fight for her i don't think I don't think Katie cares who she fights. I think she wants to fight the best out there. Like, if Katie does unify the division, becomes a, the unified champion, then she will have to start looking at those type of fights. There's also Heather Hardy, who's done some MMA as well, but she's a New York-based um, featherweight lightweight, so there could be a chance there. And she has a big profile. Like She was in an episode of Louis C.K. and So she's got quite popular in, in America and in New York. Um, and you were mentioning the, the, the WBC champion who's undefeated in 37 fights, Delphine Poon Soon. She's, the, she's probably the number one in the division. Well, Katie's number one, but, but she's in ranking-wise, she's the number one. But she's also kind of given out that Katie is, uh, everything is going for Katie at the mm. moment, you know, and she's making six-figure sums for, that's the Delphine I'm talking about. She's got, you know, she's getting mm. six-figure sums for a fight and she had to fight for a world championship for nothing, you mm. know. So already, you know. But that's a good narrative to build on, right? Audience, totally, you know? listen, I'm, I, I'm but like, kind of switch Katie from being like, the underdog, you know, the mm. humble, part, like to be in like the yeah. big, the yeah. big roller, and like this one who's really gr come up from nothing, to, <laughs> and then she's no, fighting the kind great. of yeah, the old guard yeah. sort of, you know. Yeah. But like that's the thing, like but there I've, are stories there, like it is possible. Mm. So I think, th yeah, dismissing it as an idea that she couldn't sell out the three arena is, mm. yeah. like I if there's a will, like it can be done. It almost feels as though Eddie Hearn needs to take control of several fighters in the women's division mm. and be lifting them all up together he, rather than Natasha Jonas, who you mentioned, she is professional now and she's one her first title recently so she, they're starting to build her again she's trained by Joe Gallagher in Manchester so there will be and she does have that spark and charisma yeah it, yeah and when, she, she's she like and she has the amateur pedigree you know her and Katie's fight was arguably the closest fights of Katie's Olympic run tough one in the final but the, the Jonas fight was really in an event and it was a tough fight mm. you know? but that's it like you have to like that's the thing with any kind of you know sport or creativity or whatever you can be the person that does the best you know, mm. is the best fight or whatever, but you you have to kind of yeah. submit yourself to the entertainment of it and the selling it's of funny, it. It's funny, like, it, it's well, like it, it is, it is, it kind of can be counterintuitive, especially, you know, if you like, we our new album is, you know, it's personal an album. It's very, uh, it's about kind of anxiety and it's about, you know, it's about, it's about a kind of an inward looking thing. But then you have to go out and play them live. And then you got to go do interviews and talk about it, you know. And you like when we started in Spain, our promoter. We played the same night, big night as Arcade Fire, and it was De Laurentos versus Arcade Fire, you know? <laughs> and all the interviews we did up to that, now, I, I'm going to be honest, they won that one. <laughs> but, uh, but it was all, it was, that was the angle they took, you know? And that, like, it was a show, but I was like, are we going to do that? We? But it was great, you know? I mean, the way that it, it sold the fight, and lots mm. of people came to see us, and blah, blah, blah. You know, it got us talking to people we hadn't talked mm. to. And but in the you same have way, to allow like, people were picking a side, and once you can pick a side, then you can get people really involved. And once people, like you were saying, feel involved in an event, they're going to want to be there. They're going to want to go. And boxing's perfect for that because it's literally picking a side. Yeah. Like, mm. who do I want to see knocked down? <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't think there's any reason that like that she's a woman or there's any lack of charisma there that would be a reason to not be able to sell a fight if they came here. There might be external reasons, but yeah, that would be the extent of it, I think. Yeah, we should wait and see whether we get one over the next 18 months. It's gone half-time in the Premier League, by the way. Stoke have taken a 1-0 lead against Crystal Palace, so that means they may well get to the final week of the season, still with a chance of survival. They go to Swansea on the final week. We'll have updates on that throughout the afternoon. I want to talk about the fight tonight and about some of the storylines. We've had both David Hay and Tony Bellew on the show over the last couple of weeks. And the Seven Kev were talking to Tony Bellew last week, and I thought he was really interesting about... Uh, family and what he thinks about when he's getting in the ring. So we might just play a clip of that now. 
Just, just lastly, Dave, I, I listened to you uh, talking to Joey Barton on his podcast recently, The Edge, and two things st stuck out to me when, when uh, listening to you on the podcast was how much you, you, you stressed about you being a student of the game, watching historical fights, watching, of course, opponents, yeah, but how much you studied the game be before you've even turned pro. But the other yeah. thing, the other thing uh, Tony, that stood out to me was what you said, I, I cannot be stopped when I'm in a ring. I need, to, I need physically to someone to stop me, whether that would be the referee, whether that would be my corner. It, you know, it's, it, it, is that the mentality of, of every fight you think you've ever faced, or is that just in your mindset that you will not be stopped no matter what, that you, you will never, ever stop? Even, do, you, do, do you ever think of your family when, you, when you're actually talking like that, or, or actually when you're in the fight? No. The, 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 I forget about everything. Mm. But the low blower. So when the when the cup protector goes on and my shorts go on, I don't think about anything or care about anyone. I just have to win, and I'll do anything to win. I'll go through whatever it takes. I've shown how many times I've got off the floor in my career many times to win. Uh, come from behind to knock people out. I, I just I don't know. It's frightening when I think about it like that because I know deep down, no matter what I have to go through. I will never, ever quit. That, that was a thing, though, sorry, Tony, just when you said this, I know when, when I've spoken to you and how, you know, obviously your kids mean everything, your, your, your wife yeah. means everything to you, but it, it, that's the thing that strikes you when you say something like that. It's, it's, it, they, they're obviously the forefront of your mind. Yeah, yeah but that, that just, it's like I shut the door and that's it. I've, uh, it's selfish, you could say, but I, I can't give in. Like, I ain't a fighter who can... I've had broken hands, I've had my nose broke, I've had my ribs cracked, broken in fights. I can't. I wish I could. I wish I, I could be a fighter who goes, he's got a switch and he goes, you know what, I've had enough, I'm spent, I'm done. But I can't. I just can't do it. And I suppose that's one of my strengths, but when I look at it from the outside looking, it's not a strength, it's a weakness, because it just it means I can't stop. Mm. And it means I can't give in, and that, that's the frightening part. Because to me... I look at a referee and a coach. Once the, once the training camp's over, I need two things. The, 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 my coach is there to help me, give me a drink, give me a bit of advice when he can. But ultimately, he's there to save me. Because I need saving from myself. And a referee's there to do the exact same thing. I don't need a referee to make sure the rules are adhered to or do this or do that. I just need the referee to be able to count to 10 or just save me when the time's right. I thought that was interesting, Andy, because I always worked on the assumption that fighters and sports people in general to a certain extent, when you were getting in the ring, that everything you'd worked for your entire life was sort of in your mind, that you're fighting for your life, you're fighting for your family, you're fighting for all of that, and that's, that's what gives you the power, that's what gives you the emotion, that's, what, that's a part of your strength. Whereas what Tony Bellew is saying is actually, that's great in advance, but the second I start that ring walk, yeah. it's all about me. Um, there are a number of reasons why that does, never works, uh, having that kind of... First of all, it's based in, on emotion, you know, and emotion is an energy that will only take you so far and only last so, so long, or maybe in a fight might only last a round or two. And then that, once you've spent that, you're kind of, you're looking for something mm. else. You have to be clinical, you know, you have to be cold and kind of calculated going in there. And not, you, the moment you lose your emotion or, or feed off, try to feed off emotion, I don't think it, it ever works out. And plus, it also puts extra pressure on yourself, you know? You're trying to building yourself up and making it not an internal thing, you know? It is, it is hugely internal, but you, when you get there, you just need a clear mind and just be thinking, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill this guy. And, like, what he's saying there, I don't... I, don't, I, I guess for the for, for average person listening would find it unusual, but I think that's just, that's just a fighter's mentality. You have to be like that, you know, that nothing's going to stop me and that... I don't, you know, Emotion is something out of your control, I guess, that if, if you're, you're a home fighter and you're fighting in front of your home crowd, you might build up to us, mm. assuming you're you going react. to get a, a buzz like, off that, and if that's not there, yeah, what have you got left? It depends how you react, what you react to, and uh, to what triggers you, I guess. You know, some people could use that, thinking about their family or thinking about past lo loved ones who have passed away or things like that. I'd, I've never reacted that way off. I felt that it motivated me. I always felt like... My, my, my mantra when I trained and when I fought for all my career was take the little things very seriously and the big things very lightly. In terms of I would train, train, make sure I was on top of all of that stuff. 
make sure it's on my hydration, make sure it's on my diet, my sleep, all the small things that doesn't, don't really matter, but all add up, and then take the big things, i.e. the fight, very lightly, so that in the dressing room, my attitude would be very light, very playful, and I'd be chatting away and having a laugh and a joke, and then you fight, you know, you turn it on when you get to the ring, when you walk out to the ring, it's, you just turn it on, you just, you just switch. That's, to that's totally it though, as well, like, I mean, when you like when we're doing shows or anything, you're not thinking about those things because you're focused. The, mm. Actually, anything that disrupts your focus would affect your gig mm. negatively, or it's the same way as the fight. It sounds like the same kind of thing. But in the run-up, you know, for example, we played one of the biggest gigs we ever played at a festival in Monterey in, in uh, Mexico two years ago. And if I went on thinking about what all this meant, I would have been probably too nervous to play. Whereas beforehand, you know, I was we were messing around the dressing room, eating fruit that we didn't understand what it was, and. Uh, uh, so I caught, you know, it was FaceTime and home, you know, just to keep it kind of normal and keep it kind of balanced. So in that kind of way, like, yeah, it's, it, you don't, I, I can't imagine you'd be going and thinking about your kids, because if you started thinking about your kids, you'd be thinking about how they're reacting to me getting punched in the face. Or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> That's the worst thing, like, and um, my wife used to come to the fights. I mean, the first fight I ever lost, she was in the crowd. She never comes to any of my fights. She, and that was the first fight she came to, and it was the first fight I ever lost as a pro. And it was a brutal fight, and I could hear her screaming. And it was a definite distraction. And I was thinking in the fight, oh, she's wor this is going to be terrible for her. And I'm fighting. Yeah, yeah, so <laughs> this is going to be terrible for her, you know? I remember I fought a guy in, in Miami, Oklahoma, a guy called James Cook, and his wife and kids were in the front row. And it was maybe like two or three fights from the main event. So it was quite quiet enough. And like, there was no Irish, it was in the middle of Oklahoma, so it was quiet enough. And I could hear his kids saying, hit him daddy, hit him daddy. <laughs> and I was, I, was, I was distracted, you know what I mean? So I don't know how he felt. <laughs> crazy, you know, so that was, uh, yeah, yeah. I was feeling like, it, should I hit his daddy? Yeah, I know, I actually, I only hit him <laughs> really with body shots, I actually only hit him with body shots because I didn't want to hurt, I didn't want to hurt him, you know. But that's it though, like anything that affects, anything that, like that, as you said, emotional stuff that affects your kind of flow or whatever you're in, in the mood for, because spe like especially playing gigs, you are, like there's so much things that you're remembering, I'm doing backing vocals here, I'm playing with the drum kit on this part, mm. I'm doing the lead part, and, you know, and you've got to seamlessly almost, you're almost not thinking. You're just working off instinct and all the stuff that you practiced. And, you know, your family and everything will, will can drive you with determination. That You know, driving out of the practice space late at night and doing, you know, until midnight and then driving home. You don't want to do those things, but you do them because, you know, you're trying to build something or whatever. But when you're actually, you know, at the event, you're in there, you know? I remember we played a gig and uh, we were playing away and my parents came to the show. Uh, and uh, I was playing away and I was, you know, singing away and giving it loud and looked out and my mum was in the front going, yay! <laughs> <laughs> I said, uh, oh, 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 you know, and, you know, and then, you, 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 you know. Well, no, she's but do you want every gig to be the same? So say, I don't know, you're 14, 15, hanging around Dublin and you're looking at the Olympia and you're going to gigs there and you're thinking, I want to be up there someday. Yeah. And then you're headlining the Olympia. Yeah. Do you not want a different emotion? Do you not feel oh, no, no. actually this is, this oh, yeah. is the biggest gig of our lives? This, is, no, this totally, is something yeah. different? Oh, you embrace it. You embrace the night, like, you know, and what... Sometimes, you know, what happens in the night, you just, you bring that in. You bring the thing that makes it different in. But you can't, you, you can't, it's very hard to control that beforehand. Like, you know, it's like, it's like playing football or like, a, like most sports. You do all your prep to make it as good as you can. Mm. You try and, you know, you know, you, you organize the best set list. You spend time on that. You work on the songs that people might want to hear. You, you practice sections or whatever. And then hopefully you go out and you can feel it and you can enjoy it and you can just run with whatever happens. So it means that, every show you do is different, you know? Someone is really loud in one of the boxes and, you know, you reference them and then, you know, they shout a song at you and you go, well, let's do that one. You know, you play with it and you, you, you run with it, but, yeah, you, don't, you certainly don't want to be in the moment and taken out of that. Mm -hmm. Like, you still want to be where you are, you know, the confident kind of um, person in control of the art that you're kind of presenting. You want to be that person. You don't want to be suddenly, like, thinking about your kids and suddenly you're just a dad, or, or not just mm. a dad, but you're, you know, the guy who was, you know, thinking about the wash and they're thinking about <laughs> putting the bins in. You know, you want to be kind of in this thing where you are, this is where you're kind of uh, at ease to promote yourself or play, you know. I think I maybe we're guilty in the media of wanting the emotion. Yeah, I was just going to say that, like, on the other side, as fans or, or non-sports people, we expect this otherworldly nature out of sports people or celebrity, you know, God, you must be thinking of all these big um, ideas while you're doing it. Whereas like, you'd never ask me, like, are you thinking about your parents when you're <laughs> writing an article? No. Like, why would I do that? Yeah. That would be a weird <laughs> thing to do. Like, so why, why Holly, would he expect it's, it's you to Hollywood, have that? It's Hollywood, isn't it? You know, yeah. hmm. you know, the photo of Mickey in the mirror, you know, after 
Mr. T be killed him, you know. <laughs> and Rocky goes, punch him her, and then he goes, you know. So I think it's Hollywood, yeah. but it, the reality is different. Like you say, you rely on the repetition and the training and yeah. your instincts. Yeah. And you the know. reality is the same then for everyone afterwards, because I presume the minute the fight's finished, that's when you start that's thinking you, about it. Straight away. And the same as like, yeah. if, we do, if you come yeah. off and you, you've nailed an interview or if I've done something that I'm particularly proud of, then you want the feedback from your loved ones. But mm. like in the moment, that's that's not what you're thinking. Yeah, about, yeah. yeah I, uh, I just think of like opposites. So Roy Keane, I think, was very, when he was in a dressing room, particularly with Ireland, you know, want to put out there of, you know, we're playing for the people of this country, we're playing for the people of Cork, you know, I'm playing for the people of Rockland, I'm I'm representing these. And then you're on the opposite side, I think Kieran McGinney was very much, those people it's out there don't you. matter. Mm-hmm. This is for us. We're the ones who put the effort in. It's all about us. Whereas, in a way, we don't want to hear that. We want to be, no, no, like when Mayo are going out onto the field, they have the weight of an entire county yeah. behind them. Whereas, like, you couldn't actually live with that, I'd imagine, if you were yeah. a player thinking about that. And which would you prefer, that? say, if you're going, like a player is going to take a penalty or a last minute free kick in an All-Ireland final, do you prefer the guy that you know is thinking about all the ramifications of it or yeah. the guy who's just like, this is yeah. a yeah. When he misses, you go, did he not know what it meant? Did he not know what this meant to everyone? Yeah. Yeah. He probably did. That might have been <laughs> yeah. the problem. Yeah. But that's it, though. I mean, like, you know, there... There is like grey areas to all that kind of stuff. Like you do want to be, uh, you know, you are representing people. So you do, you know, you do want to be the best, you know, version of yourself when you're, when you're like, especially I can only talk about playing gigs, but, you know, so, but things do happen. Like, you know, I've had notes passed, you know, onto the stage and you're playing and you're, you, you nod at someone. I'll look at that in a minute and then, you know, Ro might be doing a song. So I'll pick up the note and the note might say something incredibly emotional. And then you're like, oh, Jesus, like, <laughs> how do I bring this, you know? So, like, it does change, and I'm sure, like yourself, you hear someone, you know, screaming, don't hit me, daddy, you know, <laughs> don't hit my daddy, and you're like, okay, you know. Yeah. That's a brilliant technique. Why don't yeah. people take advantage of that more often? Put the family in the front row, yeah, right? Good with load of <laughs> in tears. Definitely threw me. But it, was, yeah, it, was just, it makes for a good story now, like, and, you know, I actually went out and saw his kids after the fight, and all, you know, I. You know, right? I stopped doing a body shot, so it's all right. He was bad. fine. Yeah. Didn't yeah. do any real damage. Yeah. All right, we're going to take a quick break. It is Andy Leash, Nello Carroll and Kieran McGuinness on our Saturday panel. We're here with Air, the home of Air Sport. Get amazing live sporting content free with Air Broadband. You can get your text in to 53106 or you can get us on any of our social channels as well. Stoke still 1-0 up against Crystal Palace in the Premier League. We'll be back in a moment. The Saturday panel on Off The Ball. In association with the Air Sport app allowing you to cast your favourite sporting action from your tablet or mobile phone straight to your TV. News Talk Breakfast. We see the so-called kin in Hutchfield. It has taken on a momentum of its own. It's over two years down the road. It's massive success internationally and nationally. How long more will it last? We can't predict how long it'll last because that would uh, indicate that we know the minds of criminals. But what we can predict is that our efforts will be unrelenting. Because of the restructuring we've gone through, because of the approach we're taking to the problem, as long as organised crime gangs target people trying to murder them, we'll be there. News Talk Breakfast. Weekday mornings at 7. In association with AIR. Hear the full News Talk Breakfast podcast at newstalk.com and on the News Talk app. You thought your home was welcoming, but what if we could guarantee a welcome that was warmer, brighter, and as comfy as you wanted? Welcome to Smarter Home from Electric Ireland. Our way of giving you control of your heat, lights, and immersion, all from your phone. So while thinking about a smarter home is smart, having a smarter home is smarter. Electric Ireland. That's smarter living. Find out more at electricireland.ie. Terms and conditions apply. Hello, I'm Trina Horrigan and I suffered from heel spurs and plantar fasciitis for years. Even after surgery, my feet were too sore to walk any distance. I went to Foot Solutions and they fitted me with customised arch supports and a great pair of runners. The results are unbelievable. Now I walk to work and can stay on my feet all day. The visit to Foot Solutions has made a huge difference to my life. I can't recommend them highly enough. Visit Foot Solutions in Dublin, Cork, Waterford, Limerick, Galway and Newbridge or visit footsolutions.ie. At M&S, you will find all the summer essentials to feel fabulous, whatever the weather. Pure cotton t-shirts from €6, shorts from €17, polo shirts from €20 and classic chinos from €27. Head in store or go online today. Love it for less at M&S.
What is it about the Plaza Group that makes it different from other motorway services? Is it the spacious, relaxing atmosphere? The genuine, warm welcome? Or the amazing choice of Supermax, Papa John's Pizza, Super Subs, Max Deli, Bewley's Coffee and Spa? Whatever it's about, it's about time you found out for yourself. Make your journey that little bit easier. The Plaza Group, a new era in motorway services. Open on the M7 Moneygall, M6 Loch Ray, Tipperary Town, Mallow and Charles Town County Mayo. Right now at Homebase, there's 15% off leading garden brands like Karcher Pressure Washers, Plymore Lawnmowers, Kettle Storage, and more. Hurry, offer ends Monday. Homebase, always your home, always low prices. Best thing about May? It's summer, but you can enjoy it because the kids are still in school. It's warmer, even if there's no actual sunshine. And the amazing sale is on at AppliancesDeliver.ie with up to 25% off washing machines and dishwashers, up to 60% off cooking appliances, and up to 25% off fridges and freezers. There's even up to 20% off garden and DIY, because you never know, there could be two sunny days in a row. Living the dream. The May sale now on at appliancesdelivered.ie. Why pay more? The Saturday panel on Off The Ball. In association with AIR. Don't miss live and exclusive Premier League action this month on the AIR Sport Pack. This, this is News Talk. You're welcome back to our Saturday panel, joined in studio by Kieran McGuinness of De Laurentiis, by Sinead O'Carroll from the Journal.ie, and by Andy Lee as well. 53106, the text number. Uh, we get some of your text as the show rolls on, and you can get us on any of our social channels. We're live on Facebook, YouTube, and um, Periscope. Sinead is all in red, still celebrating <laughs> Liverpool reaching the Champions League final. Yeah, I only came on so that we could talk about Liverpool. Yeah. Well, here, we've got, we've got all day to talk about Liverpool in the oh, Champions dear. League final. Oh, dear. <laughs> Do you look at Jurgen Klopp and think, oh, I'd like to work with him every day? Oh, yeah, he's he's just has a manner and a pleasantness that is unusual, I guess, in a modern day football manager. Um, I was thinking about it coming here and I think, uh, and the Mourinho clip made me think about the differences between him and Mourinho that people are, are saying that he's so good to work with mm. and, you know, he's almost paternalistic and I don't think he's quite that I think there's a more there's more of a steeliness there there has to be yeah and like he's talking when he talks about Mo Salah he talks about you know we made an agreement when we first talked um, you know as I talk to any player I'm going to sign we go and we make an agreement that we're going to work together so that obviously means there's you do X and I'll do Y and it'll work out for the whole the whole team um, compared to say Marino who like throws his players under the bus every second day you know the likes of Luke Shaw or whatever um, so I think there is that pleasantness around him and obviously he's very intelligent but also I think there's that's probably masking a lot of steel that we probably don't see but maybe the players do. He says, I have this helping syndrome. Mm. I really care about people and I feel responsible for pretty much everything. Yeah, and he does seem to, and when we saw him, how he reacted to Sean Cox and how he stayed in the stadium the night and was really interactive with the fans when they were being made stay there until, I think, 1am. Um, there do definitely does seem to be an element of, of caring there, but, you know, he's also still everybody's boss, mm. <laughs> you know, and I th don't think you can forget that. So, like, we've all probably had bosses who've been massively supportive or, you know, but, you know, they're still in charge of your day-to-day -day and they still need you to you know, cop on at times. So I'm sure he's he's getting that yeah, from his players because otherwise they wouldn't be in the Champions League final. It's funny though as well, like we were talking about stories and stuff. I think people really have kind of warmed to him and, and mm. what's the phrase? It's like they've kind of bought into what he's, the way he is. Like it's really funny. People are talking about what an amazing coach Klopp is, but I think Liverpool are playing Chelsea tomorrow or tonight. Mm. And if, you know, Chelsea win, which it's totally possible because Liverpool might be resting players and the end of the season and everything. Well, then there's a good chance that, you know, Liverpool could come fifth, you know, now obviously they could win the Champions League, but, you know, second place is Mourinho and there is no romance there. You know, there are, there's an entire squad full of players who people are seeing as being a disappointment and underperforming and, you know, it's just, just this constant negativity because of Mourinho's style is this, this is the way you do it. And if you don't do it, you're gone or you'll be punished or, you know, you do it like this. Whereas Klopp does seem to want to improve players, you know. So it's amazing the amount of Liverpool players. I mean, like from Firmino to Salah to Robertson to, you know, Milner, all across the board, you're talking about players who are, have stepped up and improved this season. And as well, it's, just, it's obviously the same in Man City. Like there's from Sterling to Adamendi to everyone, there's all these players who are improving. And it does seem to be, a, the, like the personality of the manager seems to be very kind of nurturing. And they're quite different styles of managers. They're obviously very, um, 
they obviously have very kind of strict uh, kind of tactical ideas and all that kind of stuff. But it, it's uh, it's just impressive that 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 idea of coaching, like people want that. People want the pe players to get better. Every, people want to play for a team where you look good and you're enjoying it. Mm. You know, nobody. I can't imagine Martial and Rashford and all these guys for United are loving being there because it just seems to be like constant negativity and well, as you well, said, like, look, being thrown under the bus yeah, the whole time. Like look at the direct example, so say Lovren gets a huge amount of, um, you know, criticism, a lot of it justified, but instead of say what uh, Marino does to Luke Shaw, uh, Klopp goes, well, do you know what? It's really hard to be a defender for Liverpool unless you're Sammy a hippie, I think was what he said. It's really hard to be a defender for Liverpool and it's really hard to be a goalkeeper for Liverpool. So, And then he defends them and says, well, you know, Van Dijk makes mistakes. So instead of like heaping it on Lovren, he takes it away from him. Um, whereas Mourinho publicly. goes... Publicly. Publicly, yeah. We don't know what happens then. E exactly, but that's the, that's the bit that mm. matters when we're talking about people's confidence or whatever. Privately, he, he knows his players, so he knows how to... Um, make lover and kind of don't look well, it, it kind of loses it then in the last 10 minutes he does look like that very nervous I don't want the ball to come near me <laughs> corner back that I really recognise <laughs> like, um, but obviously he works on him and, and it's really important that in public you're not getting yeah dished by your by your manager well, like, imagine how does he think yeah. that works it brings me back to the sort of hype marketing side of things that Klopp understands that of Tap, he's tapped brilliantly, and I think maybe he's a brilliant emotional intelligence of yeah. getting in with the Liverpool supporters. So Liverpool supporters haven't had a lot to enjoy over the last 28 years, certainly in terms of league titles. But they have, over that quarter of a century, developed some sort of a, yes, we're all in this together, and the club is greater than just the players on the pitch, and probably because of what happened at Hillsborough and the fight for justice there. Yeah, yeah. And club has gone and tapped into that and felt that Anfield is this theatre that is unlike anywhere else in the world and it's not. <laughs> but he says it is, the supporters believe it, the players believe it, so therefore it all works. But they want to believe it, because the they football want team it. want, they want that, you know, they don't want, like, like, I don't know, I'm not a Man United fan, I imagine if a Man United, you know, they would look at themselves and say, you know, Manchester United PLC is doing so well at its, uh, you know, branding and marketing at the moment. It isn't that great. We're number one. You know, I, I can't imagine. Nobody wants that. What you want is a Klopp, you know. And I think there's a, there is a bit of, you know, there's a bit of art in what he's doing. You know, he's yeah, playing with it like he's, absolutely. you know, I don't believe a lot. Of, not that I don't well, believe. Football supporters don't want to live in the real world. Roy Hodgson comes in and quite <laughs> rightly would go into games saying, oh, listen, we're playing Chelsea. This, or I think as Dion Fanning was writing this morning, a cup game against Northampton saying, listen, it's going to be a really tough test. And ultimately, he was right because they ended up losing. Yeah. But yeah. Liverpool supporters don't want to hear that. They want to hear, we're one of the biggest clubs in the world. We'll take anybody on our day. Yeah, and that's it. Just, like, it's all about personalities, especially at the top level. Because at the top level, you imagine these Premier League footballers are so good. You know, if they turned up on a Tuesday when I play football and, uh, you know, walked in, any one of them from any position would be an absolute, seem like a god, you know. So that's the level that everyone's at. So it does come down to psychology and it does come down to how you motivate players and how you build them up and if you can improve them because like Raheem Sterling you know like for him to step up like he has uh, the amount of pressure that fella must be under like but he stepped up and he's amazing like, like there's definitely a nurturing there because for every Raheem Sterling there's that guy that I can't remember the name of who played for Man United and everyone said was amazing and then went to West Ham and then disappeared off the face of the earth and Javier Hernandez no not oh, that guy um, scored two goals against Aston Villa <laughs> he's really good and then he didn't he didn't keep going and now he's trying to play for Yanazai no no <laughs> I anyway, think, it's gone. I think some oh, of the art. <laughs> there no. we go. Oh, God, how, how many players do Manchester United <laughs> have, have, have failed to step up? No, the guy who uh, who uh, Gig said was the best he'd ever seen. Ravel Morrison. Ravel Morrison. Yeah. Ravel, I think, had other issues was part of the problem. Yeah, but you know what I mean? A, a, someone to nurture you, someone mm. to sit you down. Yeah. Like, I don't believe that every single pre player in the Premiership is a, you know, a powerful self-starter who gets up in the morning and you know, points at himself in the mirror and says, I'm going to nail today. There's a lot of people that need an arm around them. And the right manager can, can, you or, know, can or the, do that. Or the arm around the whole team, because I, I was noticing... Um, so that before the first leg of the Roma game, uh, Klopp did uh, invite everybody in to do interviews. He did Channel 4, he did give a 20 minute interview to Channel 4, he did a huge inter interview with The Guardian. And then that can sometimes be a bit nervy, like why are you opening up the, the club and opening up yourself just before the biggest game um, of the year? And then he distracted everybody by talking about Brexit. Brexit. Like, so the entire chat that he had opened up himself to and he'd opened up the club to was then this intelligent guy who's into politics talking about Brexit. Like, that wasn't accidental. He didn't decide yeah, yeah. that day to, you know, like, 
go in, have an interview. And Again, I think that's like, good press. We had Graham Hunter on the show a couple of weeks ago who also sat down with Jurgen Klopp for a good hour for his uh, podcast and he was saying Matt McCann, who's the press officer at Liverpool, almost approached him, I think, and thought... Yeah this is a good place for Jürgen to sit down and give his, because people are saying, oh, maybe he's not tactically astute, to sit down and talk tactics and his routing yeah. and get that message out there. And again, that's a getting shield. ahead of it. And that's a shield to everybody. That mm. was a shield to Mo Salah, who was obviously under a huge amount of pressure to keep going as he's going. It's a shield to the Lovrens and uh, everybody who's there who might feel that pressure a little bit more and doesn't want to be caught up in a, in a media bubble or in a hype bubble. Uh, keep it away from them and talk about Brexit, like, of all yeah. things. Well, I, see, like, I think, that, you know, you need to be smart. I'd, like, I'd say... I'd say all the Premiership managers are are very smart people. Mm. Like even Mourinho, I think is very smart. You know, I think I think he's a bit of a pain well, Mourinho, and all the rest. But he's he's first obviously week at Chelsea walks into the dressing room. Frank Lampard's in the shower. Mourinho arrives in. Lampard's thinking, "What the hell is going on here?" And he goes, "You're the best midfielder in the world. The only difference between you and Zidane is he has the trophies. You're going to get them trophies this year." And Lampard thinks, "Bloody hell!" Great. Like, <laughs> where is that Jose Mourinho? Yeah. Or maybe it's still there. And again, he's just getting the marketing side of it. Yeah, completely yeah. Completely wrong. Although it would be intimidating if you know. Mourinho got into the shower with you and started pointing at you, telling you. You'd be inclined to definitely it. listen to it. Uh, but the, uh, the thing is, no. But I think that, but where Mourinho, see, Mourinho's philosophy is that you do as I say, mm -hmm. and if you stick to my system and you do everything you're told, you will do well. You know, and that, see, that has limitations in that you need players to then step up. You need players that will, you know, who will be the ones like like a Sanchez, who hopefully will, you know, could work out there. But he, you know, you can see at Arsenal, he's like, I want to, do, I'm going to do things, you know. But if you've got players that need the arm around the show, that need the nurturing, then if you're not giving it, like Luke Shaw, like the poor guy, like you'd be worried about him, you know, mm. like the amount of abuse he's getting. It's like, you know, and Rashford Outrageous. and all these guys, yeah. like you know, like it's not his reputation has been destroyed. By his own manager. <laughs> but then, but then, and but his then, professionalism has been but destroyed. Yeah. Well, it's constant mind games, because this week, uh, did you see he gave uh, the player, his Marino's player this season was McTominay. Like, to walk into a room with all those players and say, McTominay is my player, what he's actually saying... I created. Yeah, yeah that's what he's why, saying is, yeah. Yeah, he's saying that he does as he's told, you know? Yeah. And, and the thing about it is, is there's, you know, in music, in sport, there are piano lifters and there's piano players. Yeah. And you need a mix of both. And so a piano player is going to have a harder time under someone like Mourinho, yeah. whereas a Mo Salah is going to do really, really well under Klopp. But I think that's the hidden thing about Klopp. I think they are doing exactly what he's telling them to do. He just has this yeah. aura I mean, I'm a of... Fan and, like, it pains me to say, but Liverpool are playing fantastic football, and obviously they're in the Champions League final. It's a great, great occasion. But I'm not convinced about Klopp. I've, I've just been sitting here quiet, quietly listening, because I, I, I'm not convinced. <laughs> now he's going to come in. No, I don't know. I don't know. Like, I don't know. I think... Being this nice, affluent guy, you know, it's when you're winning, it's great, mm. and when your players are doing what what they when the players have all bought into what you're saying and believing what you say, it's great. But I think the wheels might come off a little bit when things don't go the way, or when you have someone who's like, "I believe in you. You're great. You're great. You're great," and then they drop you the next game, like when you haven't played well, when your phone dips. Where's that guy who's my friend, and where's the guy who's the manager? I think you know. Uh, I, I don't know. I like. See, see, he's I like at the moment, he's flying. You have to say. Well, hey, like Emery, and Emery like, Chan, right? He, he's a player that he's just he's gone, but he's left uh, Liverpool, right? He's gone yeah. to Juventus, but like well, he's probably leaving in the summer. Yeah. Okay, but he hasn't said there hasn't been a word about yeah. you know Klopp. Sometimes you see. Yeah, but that's because they're winning, and no one's looking for Emery Chan. Like, where's this great German international that we that was. Dominating midfield at one stage, you know what I mean? But because that's because they're winning. But players are like there's so much, you know. You have to be so arrogant. You have to not arrogant necessarily, but you have to have such an ego, I think, yeah. to be a player to be at that level. So when you have disagreement and you leave a club, you know pretty quickly how they feel about the previous manager. But like, I don't feel like there's an enormous amount. I, maybe yeah. I'm wrong. I don't feel like there's a lot of people. I've got to start rapping, unfortunately, oh. guys. <laughs> Go on, Sinead, make I was just going to say, I just don't know how much of private club we know. Like Alex mm. Ferguson used to say that people used to come up to him and say, oh, you were like a father figure to the players. And he was like, I absolutely was not. Like, I was nice about them in public and I supported yeah. them and, and helped them through their career. But I didn't want to know any personal stuff. I didn't want them at, at my... Uh, office like sitting down and having a father son chat with them and we didn't know that at the time we thought that he was a you know support oh, so he was a nightmare yeah <laughs> I and just it's cannot believe that Andy mission. Lee has been so brainwashed by Jose Marino he's become such a no, cynic he <laughs> can't either. even give the slightest bit of credit no, to what Jurgen no, Klopp no, has no, achieved I just said they're playing <laughs> fantastic football and he's improved but all it's all players. going to come to an end but it's 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 about like I said it's, it's knowing what your players react to 
and if mm. the, it's like a boxing coach, it's like it's like a boxing coach. If if a fighter reacts to you know getting slapped in the face in the corner, that gets gets a reaction. And that's what you need. If you need a hand around the shoulder, or a calm calm response. But, but look how nice he has been about Firmino. When people ask him about Salah, he talks about Firmino and how mm. well Firmino does and how much of a workhorse he is and how he sets Salah up. And Firmino has, like we've confirmed, we, sorry, <laughs> they've, they've confirmed, you know, his signing. Yeah. So, like, maybe that was the point all along. You know? All right, we've got to leave it there. Next season will be a big tester, you know, especially, mm. like, uh, dealing with this guy, Salah, who, you know, it's easy to have that test in Ed when you have a Champions League in your back pocket, <laughs> I guess, yeah. Mm, yeah. All right, Kieran, great stuff. Thank the you. album is called? True Surrender. Out now. I listened to it on Spotify for free. Did you? Don't do that. No. I did. I listened last night. Yes, great stuff. Well Thanks. done. Shout out Carol as always. Thanks a lot for coming in. Andy, we shall talk to you again yes. soon. Uh, we'll get your reactions to the fight, I'm sure, later in the week. Uh, that is it for our Saturday panel. It'll be up on offtheball.com shortly. Stoke still leading Palace by a goal to nil. 1-1, in fact, it is now in that game. We'll bring you that goal in a moment. And we're talking football for the next few hours. Join the conversation at newstalk.com. 2010. The year of bailouts, volcanic ash clouds and those pesky vuvuzelas. It was also the year Nissan launched the 100% electric LEAF. Over eight years, the LEAF has gone from zero to the world's best-selling electric vehicle and zero to 100 kilometers per hour in 7.9 seconds. Now, the all-new 100% electric Nissan LEAF has arrived. Zero left to prove. Book your test drive today at nissan.ie.